All right, everyone. We have a really exciting um, live that we're doing today, and it is with to be joining us now. All right, let's see if this works. Yay. Hi, Gabby. Hi, McKinley. How, How are, are you are doing? You? I'm great, thanks. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, for those of you who don't already know, Dr. Gabriela Asturias is my co-founder. I'm just gonna call her Gabby for the sake of this interview. Um, but Gabby is incredibly well accomplished in her own right. Um, she's currently a psychiatry resident at Stanford um, Stanford Hospital. How, how would I say that, Stanford Medicine? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Stanford Hospital, Stanford okay, Healthcare. Stanford, Stanford, <laughs> Stanford Healthcare, there we go. Um, and I'm really excited to have Gabby here. Thank you, Gabby, for spending some time with me to um, talk about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, which mm -hmm. is about when you have a loved one that's in the hospital for psychiatric reasons. Um, Gabby has spent a whole lot of time in the hospital on the therapeutic side, treating patients, working with care teams, and you know, as I come to this as someone who's been there with a loved one in the hospital, mm -hmm. and it's so overwhelming to have a friend. Um, I've helped a lot of people who have had loved ones in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And in talking to Gabby um, recently, uh, she shared so much insight about what you can do as a supporter to support someone um, that is actually helpful for their therapeutic team. And there's so yeah. much insight that I can't wait for you guys to hear. Um, so Gabby, um, thank you again. And I want to start by asking you a question, um, which is that if you have a loved one who's been in the hospital for a psychiatric concern, mm -hmm. whether they are suicidal, have attempted taking their own life, um, are experiencing mania, lots of different reasons mm -hmm. um, that you can find yourself in the hospital, what are the types of things that you can do to support them in their recovery as a loved one? Yeah, I think, well, thank you for having me, Mackenzie. I think, you know, what you said at the beginning, it is so scary to have a loved one go to the hospital. And especially, I think, psychiatry, you know, a lot of people are admitted involuntarily if, if they're a danger to themselves or to others. Um, and that can be really scary as a family member to to see your loved one or as a friend to see your loved one being admitted and and you don't know when they're going to come out, what's going on. And, and I think navigating that uncertainty and understanding how things work on the other side, I think can help you think of ways to support your loved one. Um, so to start, I just want to say, if you get admitted to the hospital, um, before the hospital can talk to you, any other family member or friend, that patient has to give the hospital permission to do that, right? And so patient safety is the number one concern. And when we admit a patient, the first thing we ask is, who can we talk to about the care that we're giving you here? Um, and we do that to protect the patient because imagine like you were hospitalized and anyone could call and get information about you. That would be very scary as well. And so we always ask them who they feel comfortable with, which family members, it can be friends, it can be colleagues, it can be anyone that they have in their support system. And once we have that permission, uh, then we can talk to you. And I think, you know, loved ones can do two things while you're in the hospital. One is by talking to the treatment team, you can give us a lot of context. Sometimes, you know, and, and that's really common, we meet patients for the first time. No one, none of the team members have treated them outpatient. We've never met them. We haven't seen them through weeks on end to go through therapy or just how they are in their day-to-day -day life. We only have what we saw in that moment. And we're basing a lot of our decisions based on what we're seeing. And so I think when we can talk to, when we have permission to talk to you either as a family member or as a friend, you can give us a lot of context, like what's going on in their life? What have you been seeing? What have this, what have they been worried about or what have you heard them say uh, and what is worrying you about them? And that gives us a little bit more of a picture to kind of start understanding that person and putting them in the context of their lives. So I think you can contribute a lot to their treatment by giving us context. Um, and then the second thing is most units, if the, if the patient gets permission, they allow you to visit them and you can come visit them and you can bring them certain items that are allowed that make the patient feel more at home and just, you know, seeing that you there and having things that remind them of home can just make the environment more therapeutic for them. Um, oftentimes you can also, if you can't visit one day, you can call. Um, 
very commonly they allow you to bring them food which i know is a big thing for people you know having a home cooked meal um, or a blanket or something that they always sleep with those little details can make a big difference in their recovery and as their loved one you can bring that to them and just having you there and for them knowing that people are worried about them and that they're thinking of them can make a huge contribution to their well-being Amazing. Well, thank you. So many good tips in there. One thing I want to ask is you mentioned that it's important for safety concerns because you can imagine a world where um, there could be a stalker yeah. involved that wants to know where somebody is for security purposes. It's important. And, and that's context the hospital doesn't know. They don't know how to mm -hmm. navigate that. So they really just have to go off of what the patient says, I can, I, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, how do you even, I guess, determine that? And, and I can also to imagine a situation where the patient might due to what they're struggling with imagine that somebody is a stalker that's actually a close family member that just cares about them um so if you do in the event get denied let's say you're you know the person in the hospital has psychosis and they've decided that you're um you know they're having a um a situation where they they think that you're trying to attack yeah. them and so they they deny permission for your, their um, care team to share with um, someone who could actually provide great context. Is there any way for that family member to or friend to provide the care team with information, even though they've been denied? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a very tricky situation. And, and as a family member, not being allowed to talk to your family members, doctors, or even visit or call the patient can be very distressing because you feel even more confused about what's going on. I will say in general, uh, doctors will err on the side of caution and always follow what the patient says. And I agree, there are a lot of instances that I've lived where a patient just doesn't want their parents calling for whatever reason, it can be due to what they're going through or maybe there's something that happened with their parents in childhood that is coming up for them in this episode of psychosis. There's so many reasons why they might not wanna give you know, access to, to what's going on to some family members. Um, and we always are on the side of caution and we, we respect the, pre, the patient's wishes. Um, and you know, a lot of times, like a lot of traumatic things have happened to the patient by family members. And even though the family members want to show up and be there, part of what's contributing to this decompensation, how the person's presenting is associated with their family, especially seeing their family members. Wait, just, quite I'm gonna distressing. jump in really quickly. Yeah. Can you explain what decompensation means? Oh yes, decompensation just means like, if you have a mental illness and you have a certain baseline and by baseline i mean like almost every day kind of looks a certain way and then it starts looking worse and by worse it could be things like maybe there were things that you could do or that you could tolerate that you can no longer tolerate or maybe it's getting harder to wake up and go to work or when you're at work you're having more conflicts with colleagues or maybe you're more irritable you know so things that are and i'm not talking about you know we, we all have those nights where we don't sleep and we're irritable I'm not, I'm not talking about that necessarily i'm thinking more about you know is it something that is affecting your ability to engage in the things that you do on your day-to-day -day life like is it affecting your ability to complete schoolwork, to go to school to engage with people around you uh things like that and if it gets to a certain point where you know you, you're, you're causing problems most people end up in the hospital and you can be brought in by different people you can be brought in by yourself if you notice this on yourself i'm doing these things and i i've done this before and i don't want to go there and i'm seeing myself go in this direction um so there's some people who have really good insights um i've seen this more commonly in substance use um where they kind of see where they're headed and, and come to us but there's also people who are brought in by family members, by friends, by other students that they share a dorm with, um, by teachers, you know, anyone who sees a change in how they, your demeanor and the way that you engage with people, if they're worried, they can bring you in for an evaluation. And at the end, you know, when you, when you come into the emergency room, that family member, that colleague, that person who made the call who brought you, it is not their job to decide whether you need treatment or not. There's professionals, you know, that do this every single day. We evaluate patients all the time. We have context about how to do this. We, we know how to approach this and we're gonna take on that burden. The family member or the loved one who's bringing that person, again, it could be a teacher or a roommate, um, is just doing their job by saying, hey, I see that you're struggling or I see that these things are getting harder for you. I think we should go seek help and then get there 
you know, the professional's guidance. You know, at the end of the day, even if they don't hospitalize you, it might be that because you went to the hospital, you got that outpatient psychologist to give you therapy that you were looking for and having such a hard time finding. So it's a good, um, like when in doubt, just go ask, you know, just how when we, when we wake up sick or we break something or we think we broke a bone or something and you're like, oh, should I go to the emergency room? Should I wait to talk to a doctor? It's the same decision, right? Like something's not feeling right in our bodies. In this case, it's our minds. Um, I go and ask the ED doctors and, and they'll tell me and they'll give me that guidance. Um, and I think sometimes uh, people feel really bad about taking someone to the hospital, like, oh, this person's gonna blame me. Um, but in a lot of cases, it, it saves a lot of lives. And, and sometimes, you know, sometimes you're not necessarily a danger to your own life, but maybe a danger to ruin irreparably relationship with your company or things like that, that become very difficult to rebuild afterwards. And so having that intervention can be very important. That's super, uh, but I didn't, super helpful. That's can you explain a little? <laughs> yeah, thank you for that explanation. Okay, I have so many questions for you. One would be, you mentioned that it's always good, just like if you know, you're know you mm -hmm. not feeling well, your heart, like you're feeling like you've got chest pain, you know, go to the emergency yeah. room. Like most people have that reaction. Um, but for mental health, you know, if it's something uh, mentally related, mm -hmm. what are those equivalents where it's like, mm, I might be on the fence, like what are those scenarios where it's like, if you're experiencing this, go to the hospital, where it could be you're like, I don't know if I'm having a heart attack or not, um, but I'm gonna go, but I, I should go check. Yeah. So what would be the equivalent within the psychiatric world? So I think the way I would approach this question is thinking about why do the people get admitted to the hospital, right? And so yeah. danger to self, danger to others, or what's called grave disability is it's really hard for you to secure food, housing, you know, the basic necessities. Um, and so what can lead to this, right? What can lead to you being a danger to self or others or not being able to secure your basic necessities? Um, so I think one of them, one of those reasons can be like depression. So severe depression, suicidal ideation. And I think for people who are not trained, it's really tricky to, you know, see someone who's low and know, is this just feeling low? Is this like, you know, going to last a couple of days or is this a more deeper problem? And I, I think it's a tricky situation, especially if you're not the person and if you're just witnessing someone's behavior, because you don't have the insight into all of their mind and what they're thinking. Um, I think what I would recommend in those situations is ask people, uh, you know, I think uh, it's a lot of people feel like it's taboo to ask someone about their thoughts of ending their life or hurting themselves. And people, I've heard a lot of people say, say oh, you can't ask that because then the person will think more about it. And it's almost like encouragement. And in reality, that's not the case. Uh, you know, asking someone about that, some people really want to be asked and they really want to know um, that someone out there cares. And most people that are contemplating ending their life, you know, don't really want to end their life, but they don't see another way out of whatever that's causing their suffering. And so I think if asking those questions um, and showing them that you're there for them and they're to listen and that they're not alone is really important. And if you're, you know, that person saying, yes, well, I've been thinking about this a lot. And, you know, sometimes I'm really worried because late at night, you know, I have these medications or I have this other means and sometimes I do think about using it and it's in my house, you know, means, you know, having access to the means to end your life is one of the first things that you have to think about. Okay, this person should be seen in the hospital because um, there's a distinction between like passive suicidal ideation and, and that can be described as some people saying, well, it would just be easier if I didn't wake up. And so it sounds a little more vague, it's nebulous and it takes a little more skill to tease that apart and know is this like, active or or is it just you know someone who's hopeless or who feels very overwhelmed and just kind of wants to shut the world out um and that's a common feeling in anxiety and panic attacks and depression to just feel overwhelmed but then there's also the other case which is you know having active suicidal ideation thinking of a plan and even thinking of how to make that plan happen and so i think if you you were in if you're on the fence and you've heard certain statements from this person, you've asked some questions, but you just don't feel comfortable because it, it is a very difficult conversation to have with someone. And, you know, we have that every day with right. people. So eventually what would be those questions that you would want to ask, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you pretend that I'm, I'm feeling suicidal or, or you're suspecting that I'm suicidal, what would be those questions you would ask me? 
as a psychiatrist, I would ask or you as a specific question. I think as a reporter, I, not, a reporter, a I would ask, uh, you know, how long have you been thinking about this? Uh, I would ask, how often are you thinking about this? Is this more like just yesterday I had this thought because this happened? Or is it, well, actually, I've been thinking about it for a whole month um, and very frequently. You know, you're trying to get a sense of like, is this something that, that's been going on in their mind for a while? Are they thinking about it very deeply? Um, another question you can ask is like, have you thought about how you would do it? How would you go about ending your life? And that I think when people start giving concrete answers to how they think about ending their life, that's when I would, like my threshold for that would be really low and it would be like, I think we should go talk to a professional and get you some help. And the person may or may not want you to do that. And so that's another thing you have to learn to navigate. Um, but if someone has thought about how they would do it and how they would get that, and I mean things like saying I would do it with pills or I would, use a gun and I actually have a gun in my house or, you know, there's a lot of uh, different ways. And if people have concrete thoughts about that, my re reaction to that would be like, get them help. Um, right. right. Or always err on the side of caution. And even if they have not thought of the means, but it sounds like they're thinking about it every day and maybe they're drinking as well. And in, in these states of mind, when they're drinking, they think about it even more. Uh, people can be more impulsive. And so I would also have a low threshold for that and think, okay, I think we should go get you some help. And, you know, going to the hospital doesn't always have to be like an abrupt, like violent experience. You know, you, you can go with the person. You say, I'll sit with you. I'll wait with you. You know, we'll see what they say. We'll see what they suggest, you know? And I think um, a lot of people fear taking people to the hospital because you hear things and, you know, being hospitalized against your will sounds really scary. Um, but to me, the alternative sounds scarier. I think having you in this world is more important. And... I think anyone who loves that person and who's around that person should do everything they can to prevent their loss. And so I think my threshold for that is low and, and I would always try to err on the side of like calling someone. Another yeah. thing you can do if the person doesn't feel good about going to the hospital, maybe there's a lot of hotlines you can call and just, you know, calling the hotline together, sharing what the person's told you and helping mm -hmm. them open up about it. The hotline can also help you guide yourself into okay is this person someone that should go to the hospital or not because it's a, you know you're not trained you're never going to be perfectly trained how to do right. this this is why we train for years and so ask the questions don't be afraid to talk about it but always err on the side of caution and, and either call a hotline or go to the hospital right. and right. this is for suicidality another reason to go to the hospital would be psychosis right and and manic episodes and in bipolar disorder and i think those are a little sometimes can be very easy to detect and sometimes can be very tricky. So, you know, things that you can notice, especially manic episodes, you know, people talking really fast, you can't interrupt them, you can't get a word in, uh, a lot of irritability, uh, much, much more than, than you've ever seen them in their normal day to day. Um, seeing them maybe talking about things that you've never heard them talk, like they're going to be build I don't know, like, oh, I quit my job, I'm gonna write this book, and suddenly getting really involved in a humongous project that you've never heard them speak about, or not sleeping, a big sign. If you literally, if they're not sleeping at all, also very high likelihood that they're in a manic episode. Um, to be honest, like, manic episodes are quite obvious. If you've seen a person every day, you're gonna see that they're worked up, that they're not sleeping, that they're, you know, very, you know, they're going at a thousand speed an hour, um, I think in those cases, it's really important to just take them to a crisis center. Um, and I can imagine it might be difficult for somebody who's having it, is, is actively in psychosis or is having mm -hmm. a manic episode to encourage them to go and get help or to go with you to a crisis center it could be challenging. So what do you do in that situation if you identify that somebody, or, or even in the situation where maybe those are two different things to talk about, but is, mm -hmm. is actively suicidal, they have um, they have the means, they have intent, and it's at a threshold where you feel like this is, we need to do action here, um, but they're being resistant. What do you do in those situations? Yeah, I, I think if they're being resistant, I would prioritize their safety and, you know, there's ways to take them to the hospital that don't require you doing that leg work. And so you can always call the police uh, or paramedics. They're trained to do these kinds of evaluations and bring people in. Um, I know that word police can sound scary, uh, but again, I think the alternative is scarier. So right? is that and me picking up the phone if I'm in the States and calling 911? Yeah. 
and then talking to the dispatcher about the situation like i'm here i have someone i think is having a manic episode Mm -hmm. here's what i'm observing or i think they might be suicidal when you're in a a more urgent situation like that where you're pretty sure that you're you have a strong feeling they might be having a manic episode um having psychosis or you you have Mm -hmm. no high means high intent should i be calling a crisis should i be calling 988 or should i be calling 911 i think if you're talking about suicidality then i would call 988 if you're talking about um other the other cases like psychosis and stuff i would just call 911 um because 911 will send someone over that can evaluate and put you on a hold so they are allowed to put you on a hold and take you to be evaluated to the hospital um and you know again holds can be scary you know the idea that they're taking you against your will um but the whole concept of a hold is to ensure that as i'm transporting you to get evaluated you don't you don't change your mind right if if a police were to come here and convince you that you should get evaluated which is really hard actually when people are in a manic episode or are having any kind of psychosis that can happen with different illnesses um it's hard because your perception of reality is changed and you can have certain hallucinations or even paranoia around certain elements that can remind you of a hospital, remind you of police. So it can be the scariest thing in the world to you that they're asking you to do this because it can be associated to other things that that are happening in your brain and that feel true to you. So I do think that in those cases, as a lay person, I don't think you should take the responsibility of, you know, taking that person by force in a car. Like that's completely unrealistic. You can hurt yourself, you can hurt them. It can affect the relationship. So I would just call 911 and they will do an evaluation they can put a hold and they can take that person to the hospital and then the moment they arrive in a hospital a psychiatrist has to evaluate them and if they're if it is inappropriate and that person doesn't actually have to be in the hospital they will lift the hold and that person can go home so just because of the fact that you might have been put a hold in transportation doesn't mean that means necessarily that it will be continued does that make sense because when we so hold in the u.s every state does a little differently but the first hold at least in California, it's called 5150, and it lasts 72 hours. But the way we think about it is we're evaluating you every day. So if you're doing better in one day, we will release you. I mean, our goal is not to keep you for the sake of keeping you. Our goal is to stabilize you, to optimize your medications, to get you the treatment that you need. And our goal is always to get you back out because at the end of the day, we want to help you live your life. And the way to live your life is with society, right? And if you're completely sequestered from society in a hospital for a long time, you you might be doing great in that setting, but the moment you get out, have access to the internet, talk to people again, and just interact with other people, and you can get a lot sicker, well, that's not ideal either. And which, this, which is why when we hospitalize you, a big part of that hospitalization's goal is to get you to your next step and, and get you stable enough to go to that next step, engage with treatment, engage with therapy and stuff like that. And so our incentive is not to keep keep you longer than you need. It's to keep you the amount you need to be stable enough to continue on that healing journey. And so, um, again, I think err on the side of caution, call 911, get them to evaluate the patient, take them and see a psychiatrist. It's not your job to evaluate them. And if you're truly afraid for someone's well-being, I think the best that you can do is help, you know, take them to people who've trained to do those evaluations. Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry, I I lost my audio can you hear me oh yes sorry oh. i was on mute can you hear me um, now yes <laughs> <laughs> all right so that is an excellent segue you mentioned that the goal of taking some of the hospital and of the psychiatric team is to evaluate get you so that you can go to that next step mm-hmm. so what i ask you about now is what does that look like you've been in the hospital the psychiatric team has decided okay they're stabilized now they can continue on in their treatment journey mm-hmm. um what is that sort of process of, of changing to the next step look like? Um, mm-hmm. And I and yeah, let's start there. Yeah, I'll tell you theoretically how it's supposed to work. And, you know, it will be very different in every hospital because different hospitals have different right. resources. But in general, uh, you can be hospitalized for psychiatric reasons involuntarily and voluntarily. Not every hospital or place has a voluntary admission for psychiatric, psychiatric reasons. Um, so most of the cases will be involuntary. And again, you can only be hospitalized if you're a danger to yourself, to others, or if you can't secure the basic things uh, for yourself, shelter, food, et cetera. So 
we need to stabilize you until you're no longer a danger to self, others, or in grave disability, right? And so my goal is give you medications, engage you in therapy. There's a lot of uh, hospitals have group therapy available. It can be led by psychology, it can be led by social work, it can be led by occupational therapy. You know, sometimes they do exercise, they do dance classes, they, they do things to engage you uh, beyond just the medication management and the conversations with the psychiatry team to help you kind of get to a point of stability so you can go on to the next step. And for us, stability is really kind of those three things. Like we need to make sure you're no longer a danger to yourself and to others, because most places that we can send you after the hospital, and there's many different names for them, but you know, a common one, like a residential treatment program or a partial hospitalization program or an intensive outpatient program. Um, these are some names of, of places we can send you after the hospital. A lot of them, not always, but a lot of them exclude people with active suicidality. So I have to stabilize you to the point where you you don't have intent and a plan um, and you're at risk of committing suicide. And the reason that's important is because when you're in a psychiatric unit, you have a 24 seven observation. You know, there's always gonna be, the nursing team is there. Uh, you have a psychiatry team, a psychology team. Well, depending on how re well researched the, the place is, during the day and at night you have on-call physicians who are available to you. Um, you may have social workers that are part of the team, occupational therapists, and they're all thinking about your well-being. They're all working together in this multidisciplinary team to think about how to get you to that point where you can go to the next stage. And so since you have all this observation and all these resources, there's literally nowhere else where you have this amount of attention, so to speak. Like whatever goes next for you, you will have less observation and less interaction with medical professionals and so we have to make sure you're safe right um and so this is an environment where nursing is is watching you or a lot of things are not allowed most places you know no electronics no cords no no thing nothing that's sharp nothing that can be dangerous and so all of those things are to protect you and other patients while you're getting stabilized uh, but when you go to your next stage most programs do allow electronics and do allow regular clothing and, and will not be watching you 24 seven. And so they don't want to accept someone who's gonna be at risk of doing something if they're not observed 24 seven. So that's kind of the logic behind how long do I keep someone here? Yeah. Um, and so what does the next stage look like? I think this varies a lot based on like resources of a hospital, but if there is social work available, they're normally the ones that are thinking about uh, what places you can go to. And I think the treatment team as a whole, especially like, you know, the evaluating psychiatrists and psychologists are recommending what you'd be appropriate for. Like, oh, you, you know, you might need residential and residential means you go live somewhere, you go get treatment there. It's less intensive than inpatient. You'll have less observation and there'll be more expectation that you participate in groups, that you participate in one-on-one -on -one therapy. Whereas the inpatient, especially with people who are very ill at the beginning, we're not going to be, you know, we're not going to be pushing them to go to group if they're not appropriate to be in group. Um, and so we're a little bit more flexible in what we ask you to engage in while you're in the hospital as we're seeing the medications take, you know, their effect. Mm -hmm. But when you're in residential, the expectation is really to see you get fully immersed in your treatment. Right. And so you have to be able to and open to engage in that kind of treatment to be appropriate for residential. Um, but you still live there. So you're in a community that in a certain way is controlled. Uh, you don't have 24 seven observation, but you do have, you know, still a lot of medical providers available. You have peers that might be going through similar things. So it's still a relatively controlled setting. Uh, the next uh, settings would be programs where you live at home, but you go get treatment during the day. And you know, that how often you go to treatment varies by program and they have different resources. So for example, an intensive outpatient program, you know, it, it's almost like, the way I see it is like, almost like you're going to school. You know, you live at home, but you go to school right. every day, but then you go and back. And residential right. is more like boarding right. school. You kind of live there and are part of that community. You, you, um, you mentioned something and, and you, thank you for really beautifully articulating um, what the full options are of, of what that next mm -hmm. step can look like. I know that as a family member, having seen this yeah. happen in real life and hearing mm -hmm. lots of stories from other families, sometimes, you know, that decision-making process from the psychiatry team, you don't hear that as a family member directly from yeah. 
from the psychiatrist. And so oftentimes there's been decisions that are made, but they may not be clear to you as the family member who is, you know, worrying about that next step and what happens next. And, you know, hospitals are a crazy organization, uh, bad use of words, but there's a lot going on inside a hospital. Yeah. And so inevitably there are sometimes stuff gets lost in translation or maybe the family doesn't actually hear what the treatment plan was. Um, what would be a checklist that you would give families of what should they expect to know mm -hmm. um, before their discharge or when they're going to leave the hospital? What would you say, make sure you know this, this, and this is clear to you before you walk out those doors? Yeah, and thank you for bringing that topic up. It's something I'm very passionate about. I, I think a big part of the therapeutic journey and, and, journey and something psychiatrists should be facilitating is really involving the support of that patient. Of course, if the patient gave permission. Um, because I think if they understand what the goals are and what we're all, what the team is trying to do here, what the team will be trying to do at the next step, it's more likely that that family will reinforce those goals yeah. and help everyone get there. Right. That's my belief. Um, and you're right. Sometimes things get busy. Sometimes um, you can't talk to the family and explain. And you know, I've I've seen it in the hospital. We we always try to do family meetings where we explain what was done, what were the goals of the hospitalization, where that person's going next, why they're going there. Um, but that often, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes the family meeting doesn't get scheduled or for some reason that person discharges earlier or the team's too busy and things get lost. And so I think it's a good thing that you're mentioning. And so what I would tell family members that even if their team is really busy and they might forget to suggest it as a family member, I would recommend either requesting a uh, like a family team meeting uh, where you like family comes, patient comes, team comes, and like you can talk about what's next. Um, if that feels harder logistically to make work, a phone call, you know, requesting to talk to the team uh, is very reasonable. We have that happen a lot. You know, the nursing unit gets calls from family members and they let the doctors know like, hey, these, these people really want to talk and have these questions. And I think you calling and you know being proactive of like hey i want to understand i think is definitely the first step in case the team didn't think to do it first because there will be teams who will be proactive yeah and will reach out to you if they have permission from the patient and share all of this with you but sometimes that's get lost or, or they take too long to do it so always call always ask and then questions i would always ask is once your member has been hospitalized i would get clarity on what are the goals like what are we working here like are we so some of the goals can be, look, uh, your family members completely stopped taking meds for the last two months. And one of our goals is to get him, that person restarted on meds. And when you restart, you can't unnecessarily restart on the same dose they mm -hmm. had. You have to restart lower. So one of the goals can be, we're gonna restart meds. We're gonna go slowly up to get to that point where the meds are doing their effect and that person feels better and their thoughts are more organized, et cetera. And so that can be one of the goals of hospitalization. Um, another goal can be they're here for safety, you know, and they're here so that we engage them in therapy, medication management, until the point where we feel like they're safe, um, no longer have active suicidal ideation, and, and we have a plan of how to handle when they go out of the hospital, how they'll, what they'll do when they feel unsafe. And we do these things called safety plans, mm -hmm. where we talk with patients like, what would you do when you have these thoughts? Uh, who are your support system that you're going to call and even write the numbers? Uh, if this, then you'll do this. And so like we kind of do this uh, contract, contract, not really a contract, but you know, we, this discussion with the patient about what's the plan to ensure like a safety yourself. checklist. It's mm -hmm. like a safety checklist. Uh, again, this won't be done always. Some places are very, very procedural based and some hospitals like there's no way someone leaves the hospital without a safety plan. If that was one of the concerns. Yeah. Some places are less uh, rigorous in that sense, and sometimes they can get missed, but that's something you can suggest, for example, like, hey, one of my biggest worries is my family member has been having thoughts about ending their life, and I want them to be safe. Can we make sure there's a safety plan in place? Uh, and if the patient gives permission, that safety plan can be shared with family, too. And so, in a way, it gives you parameters as a family member, like, oh, if I see these behaviors, then I will do this. And it also, like, that same question that we were talking about earlier of, what do I do when I see these behaviors and when I hear these things? Sometimes that's, this is a good, the hospitalization is a good opportunity to write that down. And you have, you have a psychiatrist there that's thinking about this and giving you best recommendations of, of how to deal with like your family member going through certain things. 
Um, so safety is one of the goals. Uh, restarting meds is another goal. For substance use, detox can be a goal, uh, help with withdrawal, uh, help get them sober, help get them started on meds. And um, that can be really important because sometimes a lot of presentations of like unsafe behaviors or psychosis are substance driven. So getting patients to an environment where they can be medically observed and have psych like medical and psychiatric observation um, is really helpful. Um, so these are examples of some of the goals that we can be working on. And what else? Um, so make sure you ask what are the goals of the hospitalization yeah. so that that gives you a framework of like when the team says, hey, this person's ready to leave, then you can circle back and say, so do you feel like they're safe? Do, yeah. you know, do we have these things in place? Are they taking all their meds? Right. I, are they ever, because one thing you should know is that when you're hospitalized involuntarily, you still are voluntarily being offered meds hmm. unless we put an additional thing. So if I hold you legally, um, that doesn't mean that I have the legal right to give you meds without your consent. You still have to consent to all the meds. So when someone's in a 5150, as a doctor, it's my responsibility to go talk to you and say, hey, I want to prescribe you these meds and I'm going to tell you exactly what they're for, uh, why I'm using them. And then I'm going to have some meds that I might use in the event that you become agitated or that this happens or this happens. And so we go through all of that and you sign whether you consent. And until then, we can give you meds and you can actually still refuse them. Um, the only way you can give people meds without their consent is if you do something called a race hearing. And that's a conversation for another time. But just know that like getting people to want to take the meds, understand their importance is a huge goal of hospitalization. That's great. That's super happy. Okay, so just to sort of make sure I understood you properly, mm -hmm. the things that you want to make sure that you have in place is you want to understand what are the goals. So you want to ask the care team, what are the goals mm -hmm. um, so that you can follow up on, do we feel like these goals yeah. were met? Um, and then would you want to ask them too about, you know, what is their prescribed now that you're ready to leave? Um, what what do they like care to be um, leaving the hospital? Yeah, I think you can definitely ask them, okay, we had goals for this hospitalization. They've been completed. Uh, what are the new goals, right? And I think that way they can explain their reasoning of why they're recommending a certain program. Because again, the terms can be really weird or confusing to someone who's unfamiliar with the PHP, IOP, right. residential. Um, more than the terms, ask the why. Why does this, my family member, have to go here? Or why is it recommended, they don't have to go. Why is it recommended that they go here? Yeah. Because if you understand the why, I think it's easier as a family member to reinforce that idea of going there. And you can all be on the same page. Um, and you know, there will be cases that once they're done with the hospital and are taking their meds and uh, maybe their psychosis has completely resolved, a lot of them can go home and can go to outpatient care. So not everyone has to go to like a residential or an IOP. Some people are appropriate to go straight home um and and sometimes like the help you might get from a social work on the team it might just be getting forms filled out so they can take some time off work or some time off school while they you know adjust to being back home establishing routines going to their therapy and psychiatry appointments outpatient and so hospital teams can also be very helpful in like navigating other sides that are like practical about life you know schooling work um and so also communicating that to the team, like, hey, this person um, is currently enrolling these programs. Can you help us kind of explain why they need to take a leave of absence or things like that? Uh, and so you're, you're the team in charge of your family member will definitely be very helpful in that regard as well. And it's my understanding too, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the hospitals oftentimes, you know, if transportation is a concern and they've mm -hmm. recommended that you go to an IOP where, you know, you're not, you're not staying there. It's not a residential treatment yeah. program, but you know, transportation may be out of the question for you. Like you don't have a car. Um, that's something that oftentimes hospitals have resources or know mm -hmm. of nonprofits that can help assist with transportation to um, outpatient care. Am, am I right about that? Yeah. It, it varies a lot by system. Yeah. Like if you're in a private hospital versus like a VA or a county, uh, what kind of resources they have, but most of them do have some sort of resource. Uh, and there's different levels too of transportation. So there's, you know, you can be transported with observation or um, or not, you know, and just right. literally told, telling the car where to take right. you, but no one's really observing you in that process. Right. So there's like levels of how they transport you somewhere else that vary based on like how ill you are at that moment, what kind of illness you have, et cetera. Um, but yeah, they can help with that.
the thing also helped with housing. So something that I think a lot of people forget, you know, we have these programs where they treat you, but that there's also an, called something called transitional housing. So, um, you know, we see sometimes people with grave disability come in with mental illness and due to their grave disability, they don't have a home, right? Because one part of their disease is their inability to secure shelter from themselves. And so we do see a lot of people who are homeless in that period of time. They might have not always been homeless, but since their illness got worse, um, and so there are places that can you can be referred to that take people that are transitioning out of the hospital and that give you a home and then help you find housing. Housing in the U.S. can be quite complicated and quite expensive depending on where you live and sometimes hard to navigate. And so that is, you know, these transitional housing programs, I think, are great. And it's something social work teams can help you find. Um, and so that's another thing that I think a lot of people don't really know about and can be yeah. really useful for That's family really members. helpful. So what would be those other logistical categories that you can ask the hospital for support with or or types of logistical problems you might be facing mm -hmm. once you're discharged that the social work team can provide you with information on or, or be helpful in that process too? Yeah, I think to summarize, any mental health program or outpatient care and depending on how you're doing when you're going out, they will either like literally schedule the appointment or literally get you in and accept it to a program. And then you will discharge. Uh, if you're less risky, they might discharge you and you start in a couple of days or you have an appointment in a couple of days, but they should be helping you with that appointment. Second thing is if housing is a need, they can help you navigate the resources that the government or your insurance has for you. Um, they can help you with, uh, transportation, they can help you also with insurance. So, and by that, I mean, one thing is to deal with your private insurance is to make claims and figure out what they cover and what they don't so they can guide you for the next steps. But also if you don't have insurance or you need to qual or you need help to qualify to certain government programs, they can also help with that. And depending on, depending on the country you live, sorry, the state that you live in, in this country, um, there are different benefits available to you. California has great county benefits, and I've definitely seen patients who have private insurance switch to uh, maybe Medicare or other, other insurance plans because the county offerings for you are better. Uh, and so that guidance of understanding what is offered to you by the county and what kind of level of care they give you is something the hospital can, can tell you about. And for certain, you know, and again, this will depend on what the state's available availability is for their population but sometimes county offer case managers so you'll you leave the hospital but you have someone on charge of your care wow. that is kind of helping you you know get appointments and if they see that you're getting worse that they'll help you get to the next level and they're kind of you know they're managing your care so instead of just having that social worker in the hospital that you see when you're in the hospital you have one that is assigned to you as a that's amazing and so that is something that depending on what county you're in, depending on the resources of that county, that they can help the hospital team, the hospital social work team can help you connect with those county programs and help enroll you in those programs. Yes. Is that the same for, let's say that I'm eligible for Medicaid, but I haven't enrolled in Medicaid. Can the they hospital can also help enroll me in Medicaid as well? Yeah, definitely. Again, there will be settings where there's less resources, less right. social work, and they might be a little less involved and they might just say, here's how you do it. Good luck. I have to be transparent. It won't yeah. be, you know, it won't be in every setting that you will have social workers, like literally yeah. fill out the private work with you. Right. 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 I've seen this, you know, at Stanford, we definitely, you know, we have great teams and I've seen social workers sit with you and like literally help you file paperwork to get leave of absence from school, right. to get a case manager, to enroll you in this insurance, to get you these benefits. Like they can be very hands-on and, and they might do it with you as a patient or with your family. Um, it, that won't be the case everywhere, but right. I do think that at, in, at minimum, you can ask to be pointed to the right direction. So right. as a family member, you can say, hey, my family member, I think would benefit from this, like a case manager. Do you know about where I can find out? Yeah. You know, it's so just sending you the website, the links. So at least that level of guidance, I think you can, in most places, ask. For. That's really helpful. And then I guess my next question would be, you know, a lot of times, mm -hmm. obviously the psych psychiatric team is very experienced. They've seen thousands of patients. They can make decisions very quickly and feel very confident mm -hmm. in those decisions. But being on the other side as a family member, a supporter, you've never no. had this experience before. It's so stressful and overwhelming to have your loved one who is considering harming themselves or harming other people. You know, it, it can feel like decisions are made so quickly and that can yeah. be really nerve wracking. 
Um, what what would you say to somebody who who just is in that position to a family member of you know like how can they possibly feel confident or know that that is the right thing in this moment for my loved one? Um, whereas from your perspective, you've seen this a million times. It's easy, you know what it is. Um, you know they're going to be fine. So I guess what would you say to families? What I would tell them is well, of course I can't speak for every psychiatrist, of and course. there's situations of situations. But I will tell you that the way we're trained and how a lot of psychiatrists feel is they're very uncomfortable placing someone at hold. It's a really big decision to make. I don't think it's something that even if you've done it a thousand times, we take lightly, right? Because the one, like the main reason I would do that is if you can hurt yourself or someone else, you know, and ultimately that's what we're trying to prevent. And that's, uh, someone being, you put someone on a hold, that means you're involuntarily um, um, admitting them to the hospital. Is yes. Correct? Okay. Exactly. And I think hearing that your family member is on a hold can be very distressing. And the words of comfort that I can say is that we're trained to think that through and, and we don't take our responsibility lightly. I, I can, you know, now as a resident, I can place people on hold. So, so I've been thinking about this a lot as a person. Um, and, you know, we, we think about that decision deeply before we do it. And I think I've heard of cases where holds have been lifted uh, by psychiatrists because things looked well and and a lot of bad things happen from that and so I think what a psychiatrist is always thinking about is if I don't place this hold and you leave here today will someone be hurt irreparably right like will you hurt yourself a family member or will you know will you be on the streets without ability to eat and get a lot of diseases and and you know so I'm thinking like, if that's, an, if that's an option, I will put you in a halt because right. I don't, I mean, for me living in a world where there was a probability that that would happen to you for the way you're feeling right now is not the world that I want to live in. You know, I don't want to create that situation for anyone. Right. Um, so I think, first of all, knowing that being in a hold is not a punishment. You know, you didn't do anything wrong. It's, it's um, you know, our brains, work in mysterious ways that we're all trying to unravel with how neuroscience advances. And I think sometimes we're, as humans, unable to perceive reality the way most people perceive it. And it's really hard to understand why we're being recommended to go to the hospital. And so we're going to resist it with all our might. And, you know, we might have delusions or hallucinations that feel very real to us. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something you'll have to remember. Like when someone has an auditory visual or whatever hallucination or a delusion, that is guiding a lot of their actions, it is very real for them. And they can be quite distressing and a lot of them cause a lot of fear. And so I think sometimes when you see family members really fearful of being in the hospital and, and they're calling you and they're telling like, they wanna kill me here, like I wanna leave. Like we also have to understand that these are people who are perceiving reality a certain way and what they're telling you is true right. to them. Like what the, they're representing their reality to you. And it can be very distressing as a family member to understand like, is this actually something that is happening? Or is this something that, um, you know, that they're perceiving to be happening, but it's not actually happening to my family member. So I think that's what's tricky, you know, hearing your family say things like that. Um, so I don't know. I, I think um, just trying to, yeah, I think trying to establish a good relationship with the doctors and try to ask them what are the goals um, is the most important thing. Because at least for me, if I'm trying to put myself in the, in the, in the seat of like a family member of a patient. Um, I, it's very uncomfortable to think that my family member who doesn't want to be in the hospital, because most people don't want to be in the hospital, um, is being made to stay in the hospital. Um, so I think one of the things that would be important to me is to be told why, right? And to be explained why. And I think that's why that goals conversation that we talked about um, is really important to try to establish with the care team so that you hear like, okay, they're making my family members stay here, but why? Like, what are they doing for this person? So it doesn't feel like, oh, they're just locking them up. They're not locking them up for the sake of locking them up, right? There's a reason. And I think asking for those reasons can be helpful in processing the situation uh, that you're going through as your family member is yeah. hospitalized. That's really helpful. Thank you for those tips, Gabby. And, you know, I think too, my question would be, what about the flip side of that, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, so we talked about the volunteer involuntary holds where you're being required to stay in the hospital. You know, you may not want that as a patient, but the doctors have determined that 
for your safety and maybe the safety of others that it's important for you to receive treatment. Um, you know, I think that things can be very intense and you can be suicidal and mm. it can be the scariest thing in the world for the family. You're in the hospital three days later, they're ready to let you go. That can feel, and yeah. that might be me as a person, but I'm like, no, please keep them there because I know they're safe there. Mm -hmm. And the thing as a loved one is you're so worried about their safety. Um, but it, it might be safe for them to leave. And, but that can be really mm -hmm. scary as the loved one to be like, I, how, how are they, how are they yeah. fine now three days later? Like it was, you know, end of, it was catastrophic. And then now we're okay to leave after only three days. Um, so mm -hmm. how, how is it that the psychiatry team can feel so confident to make those decisions, just to comfort those families that may be shocked to hear that, okay, it's totally fine to go back to normal now. Yeah, I, and I think I would caution to say that it might not necessarily go fully back to normal, whatever we define that to be. Um, I think, let's go back to premises, right? Like, yeah. as a psychiatrist, I'm thinking, are you a danger to yourself? Are you a danger to others? And are you unable to secure housing, food, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you are no longer meeting those criteria, I cannot hold you. Right. Like, I, I, legally, I literally, I would be doing something wrong as a doctor if I kept you on a hold when you don't meet criteria. Um, and so, but that doesn't mean you don't need more treatment, right? Yeah. It might be that, you know, we restarted meds. A, a lot of, mm -hmm. I will tell you, a lot of um, people on a manic episode with a couple of days of meds can see a lot of improvement. Um, it might not be three days, it might just be six, but it can go from like, if Mike feels a family member night to day, and I've seen yeah. this with patients that I met day one, and then on discharge, so, so different. I mean, it's really, it's one of the, the things that are most easy to see that people getting through a manic episode. Um, and so I think, you know, when I can no longer keep you involuntarily, um, some hospitals will give you the option to stay voluntarily, but then others, as I said, engage social work teams and give you a recommendation on what's next. I do think that, this kind of goes back to one of our earlier points of you always have to talk to the treatment team of what's next. Right. And you have to take into account that some hospitals will have amazing resources. They will do the legwork for right. you. They will get you accepted. They will get insurance to cover it. You will be sent on your way and you will have a journey that will start in the hospital, go somewhere else, somewhere else, and somewhere else, you know? And, and that journey can be very comforting to people who are very worried for someone's mental well-being. Yeah. But Sometimes that journey is not mapped that elegantly and, and sometimes you don't have that much help and, and that's just a limit on resources. So I think that's where family members can just get involved and ask like, okay, now that they've gotten to this point, what are the next goals? Like what are the most important things this person needs to work on so that they keep healing? Uh, and some of those goals can be taking their medications as prescribed, which is a big challenge, you know? Right. and. Um, following their safety plans, going to their appointments. And so hearing those goals, uh, I think can help you as a family member, know what kinds of behaviors to reinforce and, and what to do. Um, and definitely, I think that's why it's so important nowadays to have online directories that can help us kind of navigate options because there will be situations where the hospital will just say, well, you need to find them this type of resource, kind of good luck. You know? You know, and, and knowing where on earth do I find this resource? When I just started learning about the world psychiatry, it can be very right. mind boggling. Um, and I, I do think as a system, we shouldn't let people go out of hospital without appointments, but I just know that's a reality. Um, yeah. So to, to counsel how to navigate that reality, I think try to be as proactive as you can to ask what their recommendation is and use the resources that are now starting to exist. You know, the online directory is like my, my resource. What we're trying to do is basically so people don't feel like that. Don't feel like they've just been thrown into this ocean of uncharted waters where, you know, you were scared for your loved member's life three days ago and now they're out and you're like, wait, but is that done? Like they need more help, you know? And um, I think this is the importance of having resources like that available to the public and, and free for use for the communities so they have that help. Well, thank you, Gabby. That has been so helpful. I think what I'm hearing from you at, is the, the key takeaways is mm -hmm. if you have a loved one who's hospitalized, first thing to accomplish is you want to clarify with their team um, what if, you know, what, what is the main focus mm -hmm. of their stay here? What are the goals that we have for um, treating this person to when we know that, okay, it's ready for them to be discharged? And then when they're ready to leave, um, what are the next steps and having a really concrete understanding of what 
does the care team recommend for what we do now that they're leaving the yeah. hospital? And thinking through any logistical factors, you know, can my loved one pay for treatment? Yes. Um, if not asking for, you know, being very upfront about cost and the ability to pay mm -hmm. to make sure that it's covered by insurance. Um, if you need help being rolling in Medicaid, mm -hmm. understanding what that process can look like, um, discussing the payment, discussing transportation, discussing housing, any sort of logistical barriers mm -hmm. that you can think about to being able to adhere to that treatment plan. Um, it's really important that you ask the social work team. They may not have answers for you, but they probably have a lot more resources and ideas than you might think. So it's definitely worth asking. Definitely. I agree with all of that. And as you were listening that, I thought of one point we're missing, medications. Ask why they're on that medication. Good to know. If you Google it, you might find that a lot of segments are used for many different reasons and the dosing can vary what reason it's being used for. So you can sometimes read, oh, this is for this. My, my, my family member does not have this. Yeah. And that can cause a lot of misunderstanding, even on the patients yeah. themselves. I've actually seen patients who definitely Google yeah. it. Um, which is normal. <laughs> You're taking yeah, something and putting what it is doing to your body. Of course. Yeah. Uh, and it's our job as clinicians to explain that right. to you. But sometimes the explanation can be insufficient. Yeah. Or they told you, but you didn't fully get it. You don't feel comfortable yeah. asking that moment. And you're Googling, then you get worried. So look, this is very normal in all disciplines, not just psychiatric care, that medications, you, you have the right to understand what you're putting into your body. But as a family member, I, I would say add that to your checklist of questions to ask on discharge if you're able to talk to the care team like hey what are the medications my family member is discharging with and why are they on each of those because that will also help inform you like just in general if you start seeing them skip a certain medication it kind of alerts your senses to hey you know this part of their illness might start up again you know or like they're not taking this they might have more trouble sleeping now and then that can lead to these other things so it can also help you kind of be you know, paying attention to what's going on to your family member, if you have some guidance about why we're using these meds and why are they being used in these doses. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been incredibly helpful and so illuminating to the process that, you know, a lot of us yeah. don't know exists or understand how it's happening. And this has been really special. So thank you for your time and all your amazing insights. Thank you for having me. I think this is really important to share and talk about. And I think as clinicians, we're all just trying to do our best and make the experience as, you know, as good as it can be and as healing as it can be for the people that we have to admit. And we're so incredibly grateful for the work that you do. Um, if anybody has any more questions for Dr. Gabby, please put them in the, in the comments. Um, I think Gabby, I'm going to have to steal you again to do another one of these <laughs> because I flew by. I have a million and one more questions, but I think that's enough for today. Um, but thank you again so, so much. And um, again, any, any questions, please put them in the comments. Thanks, guys. Bye, Mackenzie. Bye, thank Gabby. You.